computer is taking the copious amounts of time it does to boot, I'll uh, uh, start with some giveaways. I've got some some stress balls for everybody. If anybody wants some, here. See if there's anything. I got some other stuff too. So takes up the extra time. There's some keychains with uh, pocket knives in them too. So don't cut each other up. Okay. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, my machine should finish booting up here any second. <laughs> I don't want to have to carry this home, so take it all, okay? I don't want to carry any of it back with me. <laughs> all right. Well, what I'm going to show you today, just so I can set your expectations, um, Everything I'm going to be demoing to you today is relatively simple. If you are writing your own exploits, if you're doing all sorts of fancy, cool stuff, then you're probably in the wrong place. Um, I'm doing a lot of uh, penetration testing and penetration uh, of physical security for machines. Really, uh, my focus for the talk and actually in what I do in real life is protecting physical machines, somebody comes, sits down at your machine, wants access to your machine, making sure that they don't get on there. That's all you want. I think that's it for the giveaway. Sorry about that. Too late. Too slow. Um, anyway, let me show you. Let me bring my slides up now. We good on the other systems? All right. What I'm going to show you today, here we go. Still being slow. Oh, resolution of my monitor doesn't match up. Hey, thank you. It's wonderful when you get to do your you know, first dry run with the AV equipment right when you're doing the presentation. It's always a plus. Let me uh, change that. If my machine decides that it wants to do that too. Yeah, 10 minute startup sequence exactly. Try that. Da 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 da. That looks a little bit better. There we go. Yeah, I know. Too much tray, huh? All right, let's see if the tray will do 1024. Yeah, we'll go to 800. All right, here we go. Let's just get going. I've got a lot of junk, don't I? Jeez. Bonus. Oh. Do, do, do. I should sing or something. Yeah, exactly. Yep, exactly. Boring low. Wow. You could tell I was on the DEF CON network today. Let's just switch over here. All right. Anyway, finally. All right. So what I'm going to do today is show you uh, basically some lame security methods for protecting uh, information on your machine. Um, 
well, who am I, what am I, all that good stuff. The audience, I already told you, I'm going to show you pretty basic stuff. This is not rocket science. Um, I would know that. I do have a degree in astrophysics, so it is not rocket science, however. This is all crap, uh, just basic stuff, but most of the people in business, in the real world, don't understand uh, even one or two of these things, although a lot of you may already. Um, who am I? Uh, I'm Brian Glancy. I already mentioned that. Uh, I run a professional services team uh, in the United States uh, to deploy security countermeasures to different companies. Let's just leave it at that. Um, told you what I do. What am I going to do today? I already told you about that. I'm going to show you some of the different... Whoops. I'm not going to show you anything since the, the switch decided to go out. Back. Good. Um, my agenda for today, I'm going to show you some bad security measures. I'm going to show you some stupid things that are built and sold to all different sorts of companies, even today, uh, as security and are basically stupid. Um, they're only security against really dumb people. Uh, really give you no way, no protection, no method of keeping your information safe, uh, nothing like that. And I'll mention... Uh, also, towards the end, I'll mention some things that you can do about it, some ways that you can actually keep your stuff uh, secure, uh, and you can manage to keep other people out of your machine so when you get raided, raided by the uh, Fed panel, they can't actually take all your kitty porn off your machine and all that good stuff. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about information gathering tools. I'm going to talk uh, really simple stuff, uh, sector editors, in case you guys aren't familiar with them. Uh, very simplistic, show you how they work, show you how you can garnish information from them. Uh, you know, they actually give classes on this stuff, which is kind of scary, uh, as like forensic investigation tools. Just going to show you some basic things about how they work, what they do, what sort of information you can find, and ba also why most of the security products that are sold don't pr protect at all against most things like that. And then I'll talk a little bit about countermeasures. So where did this presentation come from? Um, last year, I, I've been to DEF CON for the last four years. I do a lot of speaking, not usually at, this is my first time speaking at DEF CON, but uh, I do a lot of speaking at security conferences uh, for the industry, for business, and things like that. Uh, and I always come to DEF CON. And last year, Bruce was a little bit more animated than he was this year. Uh, and he had a lot, of, lot to say about stupid uh, security systems. So I thought about making t up a presentation about different things that are sold to people, um, you know, by our friends at anybody from Microsoft to all different sorts of companies that pass for security products but actually have, you know, do no security whatsoever because they either have bad implementations or they don't really protect any information. Uh, and the thing that gave me the title for my speech is really not the TV show, believe it or not, but um, Bruce's book, uh, Secrets and Lies, um, has got a lot of stuff in it about the, your security only being as strong as your weakest link. Um, I want to start off with something, a statement that was recently circulated around all over the place, and a lot of people called me and asked me about it, and... Um, a lot of companies have brought it up regarding, this statement is from Microsoft. This is cut right off their website. I, I have it posted at the bottom, the URL for it on the bottom. Uh, basically what their point was, they were getting nailed all the time about EFS. I know most of you have probably installed or played with or looked at EFS. And they were getting nailed constantly uh, because people were saying, well, EFS is not really secure. There's so many tools out there that I can break it with. Um, there's easy ways to circumvent it. I can steal the certificates. I can attack it in a number of different ways. And Microsoft basically came back with this, this response. And what they basically said is, if you have physical access to the machine, there is absolutely nothing that can be done to keep you out of the machine. Um, which is not true. There's, there's, there are solutions that you can do to, to secure yourself against to secure your operating system, whether it be something like the steel, or secure your access to the machine. 
uh, which there's a lot of different people that have products and, and different pieces that do that. Uh, but Microsoft, of course, does not see that, and they named a new set of security laws called the 10 Immutable Laws of Security. Now, in case anybody doesn't know what immutable means, and I didn't know, I had to go look it up, uh, unchanging or unchangeable. So they have the, they had the balls to do a press release about this to the whole world and say that there was no way that anybody could ever guarantee if they have physical access to the system that you cannot have access to all the information on that system, which I think is rather a stupid thing to say. But here's the law. If a bad guy has unrestricted physical access to your computer, it's not your computer anymore. Well, I, I would agree that it's not your computer, but I would say it's still your information. Um, I would hope that if somebody comes into my house and takes uh, my computer, that uh, the information is still mine, and they're not going to be able to just take it off there and do whatever they want with it or you know, interpret it in any way. Microsoft followed up with, uh, if the attacker has physical access to your machine, they, have all the, they can get all the data they want, and you have no method of defense. And I say, develop a little bit of better security, and then they will have a little bit of a defense. So who cares about this problem? Who cares about information on machines? Well, I definitely care about it, and I think that anybody cares about it, that if you use your computer at home or work for confidential business or personal use, if you have documents, medical records, whatever they may be, correspondence on your machine, that you don't want somebody to, to be able to get that information if they take your computer, then you care about what happens if somebody has physical access to your machine. If you travel with a laptop, like a lot of people do these days, how, if your machine is stolen, are you going to know that nobody has that information? Now, all of you probably have seen all the wonderful hacking news in the, in the media about things like uh, you know, executives at Qualcomm losing their laptop and having beyond secret information about the running of the security infrastructure of the United States on there. Uh, all different sorts of people from financial institutions losing your credit card numbers that are on their machines and all those wonderful, great things that happen. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of different security that can be done to prevent this. But of course, we have to be educated and companies have to be educated to know that we require this of them, that they keep our information confidential and that they actually take security measures to make it so not just anybody can get into to anything they want. Okay, so now we get around to some demos. We're heading in the right direction now, and hopefully the KVM is going to work when I go to switch. Um, what we're going to demo, it is hot. Wow. Um, what we're going to demo, we're going to demo stuff about biased passwords. I see a lot of people that use biased passwords. They are the stupidest friggin' thing ever invented in the world. I have no idea why anybody would ever use them or what the purpose of them was, or what the person that wrote them was actually thinking. Um, and I think the most hilarious thing about it, I think, is that uh, the people that wrote the biased password utilities quite often are the same people that had to write for their companies the bias reset utilities for when a user forgets his password, you can reset the bias to uh, a blank password. So it's, it's a really useful security measure when you can actually even reset it when at, your, at your whim. Uh, so we're going to show a little bit about that. Then I'm going to show a little bit about boot locks. Some of you may have seen a, there's a lot of different boot lockers out there. Uh, there was a product out there that I used to love to rip up by uh, Norton Semantic called For Your Eyes Only. That sucked and was just basically uh, a feeble attempt at a security that you could hack really easily. Um, they're gone now. They went out of business. But there are still a lot of other ones. I just actually bought... Uh, the one that I'm going to hack, I bought last week, and you're going to see it's pretty dumb. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about file level passwords. Uh, any password prompt that comes up into you, up to you inside Windows, and what the problems with those are. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about EFS and why, what, what the problems with EFS are. Okay. So our first demo is. Bias, bias passwords. Let me uh, see what we got over here with our machines. Our 
that's the other HP. Yeah, but I'm going to need to switch from that one to that one. Okay. All right. Let's see. This computer, we need the... Uh, Thank you to my wonderful helpers, by the way, um, help for helping me out to run this whole thing and put it all together kind of quickly. Put the keyboard prompt. All right. So a bias password, what does it look like? Let's see if we can switch over. I'm sure you've all seen them. Assuming the KVM decides it wants to switch. What cable is that? Four. One second. It's not reading. It's on the next car. One second. Yeah, it's it's doing it right now. Thank you. There we go. That's what a bias level password looks like. Pretty, pretty easy to use, pretty dumb. Just comes up, as soon as you turn the machine on, this is the prompting that you get. Um, lots of machines have different levels of bias passwords. They have a bias password that comes on for access of information. And they also have a bias level password for changing any of the information in the bias. Well, so what do we do about this if we are an attacker and we want to get the information off this machine. How difficult is it? Well, I've got another machine right here. Do we have a keyboard plug for this guy? Okay. Too much equipment for one place, huh? Not yet, but it will be by the end of the day. Actually, mail it mail to bry, B-R-Y, at pointsec.com, and I'll mail it to you. Or I'll mail you the URL. Okay, so we have our bias password up. We want to get the information off that machine. Well, how do we do it? Well, I've got another machine that's just like it right here. All right, I want to take the information off this. I take the machine. I'm over, uh, I'm visiting a company, I'm doing whatever, I want the information off there. I pop the drive out, it takes me a couple seconds, comes right out in one hand. Turn off my other computer. And as you all know, as soon as I plug this drive in here, the bias password is not going to port with the machine. The bias password is localized only to that machine, it's not localized to the hardware. Now there are a couple, in, that's a very good point, very good question. There are a couple companies out there that make uh, encrypting hard drive controllers that link. And those companies are doing a very good job. One of them is IBM. They have a link uh, encrypting controller and that encrypting controller links to your bias password. And that's not bad, but the only big problem about it is what happens when you lose your password. That's not a good situation. So anyway, let's see if I can toggle systems now. Two. This 
This is my BIOS password system. As soon as I plug the drive into another machine, it comes right up. I actually had a CD in there, so it actually booted to the CD. That's the net, one of the other demonstrations. But it will boot directly to the machine. So basically, the BIOS passwords the, it doesn't don't protect any of the information on the machine. They don't encrypt the information on the machine except for the specialized BIOS encrypting passwords. This one just booted right up. Now this is a Wussy 98 machine. I know, I just use it for demonstration. Now, here we go. Let's switch to back to the presentation machine here. Okay. So, bias passwords. Random people can't just sit down at your computer and use it. Bad part is uh, what happens when you get when you forget your password? One bad thing, wh the, what you have to do is reset your BIOS or pull the uh, battery off your motherboard. That's the other one thing you can do. Uh, now the other question is, uh, you can wipe. What am I looking at here? Can be wiped through motherboard access. We talked about that. You move the drive to another machine, which is what we just did, and you have full access to the machine. Check the web for bias password crackers. There's also a lot of bias pa password crackers out there. So basically, that's no security at all. So bias passwords are stupid. OK. Boot lock. Um, this boot lock program that I'm going to demonstrate to you today is uh, freely available on the web. Or I shouldn't say freely available. I paid $29.95 for it, actually. Um, and what it basically, do, basically does is it prevents the normal booting of a machine by intercepting your boot sector. Now, uh, for any of you that know how hard drives work, when you load, turn on your machine, as soon as you turn it on, it reads out your master boot record, reads your, reads your master boot record, determines what your active partition is, and then reads that active partition, that partition which is Mac, marked active, uh, reads the boot code off the, the boot sector off the beginning of that drive. That's where uh, this whole thing comes into play. They actually start up as soon as you uh, try to load from that drive, um, and they prevent you from just getting in. They look pretty simplistic. Uh, all they do, drive back in this one? Yeah, good. All they really do is uh, when you boot them up, they um, give you a password. Some of them have passwords for multiple people. They have the ability to let administrators get in. They have the ability to do all different sorts of uh, cool things like that. Uh, real problem is they don't have um, anything linking, any security linking to them on the back end that would prevent you from bypassing them. You could do anything from rewriting the boot sector, which is really easy, to uh, just booting off of a disk which is uh, really the easiest thing to do in this situation. Uh, you can take a boot floppy, you drop a little sucker in there, it'll come right up and it'll, uh, it'll work for you. Let me show you what these guys look like. Uh, two. Hey, it's deciding to work a little quicker now. Three. Three is not working yet. Is that four or three? Four. Sorry about that. Uh, keyboard error. Yeah, blah. Oh, that's our bias password. Okay. Yeah, let me switch it. All right, here we go. Demos take so much longer. All right, so here's my computer booting up. It's booting up off the hard drive, and the first thing that we get is the intercepted boot code, and it prompts us 
with the bias password, with the, pardon me, the bootlocker password. Now, this password is a little bit better than the bias one that we just tried to defeat in that it is ported with the hard drive. It's actually modifying the hard drive. So if we take the drive out, we're still going to have this security when we go on to the next computer. But it's not really any better because if we put a floppy disk in it, which I think we have our floppy disk rate. Is this a bootable? No, nah, it doesn't matter. As soon as we boot it to a floppy, it's going to come up. Oh, you're right. Oh, that's the machine. <laughs> as soon as we boot it to a floppy, we can have all of the information off of it. Because we're not actually encrypting the information, protecting the information, or protecting the partition table, or any of that good stuff. All we're doing is making it harder to boot the computer. So this doesn't really protect us either. Um, and we're also still, we still have the regular problems with uh, what happens if we forget our password, what if we want to do reset, all that good stuff. This is a bootable CD that I just dropped in here. As soon as I drop the bootable CD in, you'll notice that even though I've got that, that bootlock product installed on here, I go to my C drive, I do a directory, there's all my files. So I could copy any file I want off here, I could do anything I want to the machine, there's no access control whatsoever. Now this is the same situation, there's a lot of products out here that, that fall into this area and there's a lot of people that spend a lot of money, way too much on buying them. Uh, there's products like Norton for your eyes only that I mentioned, there's this boot locker and basically if you go on the web and you, you uh, do a query for boot lock, you're going to find a lot of different people that sell this sort of thing, but it's pretty much junk. Doesn't really give you any security. Easy to get around. Uh, doesn't really protect you from anybody that knows what they're doing. So, what do we do from there? Pardon? Question? It, with, the question was, with Norton for your eyes only, you actually couldn't see the C drive when you booted up. That's correct. But if you rewrote the partition table, you could see the C drive. FDIS slash MBR. Um, yes, you could do it with FDIS slash MBR, or you could do it with a, something like Disk Edit from Norton Utilities, which is what I usually use. It works a little bit more controllably, reliably. It's not in Microsoft, that sort of thing. Uh, here we go. So, with that, what have we done? So, so far, we've circumvented a bias password system. We've circumvented a boot lock system. Now, the boot lock was easy to circumvent just because it doesn't, didn't really have a lot of back-end security. Now, it's a true point that Norton for your eyes only uh, had a little bit more security, but it actually doesn't have security against the next set of tools which we're talking about, which are sector editors. Sector editors can retrieve all the information off the machine, uh, regardless of whether you mess up the uh, partition table or not, because it just reads the information directly off the machine. All your file structures are there, all the file beginning and ending, all that stuff is there, and you could easily get it off and copy it to a floppy and take whatever information you want. So, boot locks, not really a good idea. File encryption. There's a lot of different things out there for file encryption, and I'm going to show you a couple different things. A lot of these things you may know, some you may not. The bad, things, uh, uh, the bad thing about file encryption, and basically all security products that run inside Windows after the operating system has started, is that they're cursed with having to run in a multitasking environment. So as soon as you start up Windows, or whatever operating system you're talking about, and you have a product that asks you for authentication, you have an opportunity to have another product attacking, or another program attacking that authentication scheme. So as long as you're using regular passwords and you're not using something like smart cards or two-factor authentication, you're open for open season on attacking that program. Um, 
you also have another problem with things like file encryption, which is recovery, lost passwords. Uh, also, you have an assurance problem, which is a big problem for uh, people that have secure information that they want to make sure stays secure. How do you know that they haven't been able to break it? Um, and you really don't have a way. If they can take the file away with them and work at it on their leisure, then you have no way to guarantee. Your only real way is to make sure that they can't get in the file system at all. So what am I going to show you on that? So file encryption, it allows you to uh, protect your information with strong encryption. Weakest link is that it, uh, it runs in a multitasking environment. Password security is only as strong as the password, which is true. So we're going to sh we're, I'm going to show you some of the different tools you can use to attack it. Uh, there are some possible mitigations, things like dynamic tokens, X9.9 challenge response tokens, which I don't know if some of you guys are familiar with. They're basically hardware tokens with an encryption scheme built into them. So you have to have the token uh, in order to authenticate against your machine. Uh, there's also smart cards that you can authenticate against your machine. Uh, and if you don't have the, the key that's burnt into that smart card, you can't access the information. So if, uh, for example, a good example would be if you uh, encrypted on a smart card and you put that information uh, on your machine, uh, but you took the smart card and you had it in your pocket, somebody could run off with the machine and do whatever they wanted to do and they wouldn't be able to decrypt it unless they were, had the actual physical key that you had. USB tokens, another good example. They have some weaknesses also. They have been attacked in a couple different ways, but uh, generally they're pretty darn good. Uh, there's also biometrics and things like that. Let's look a little bit at what these things do and uh, how to attack. All right, well, we've got a couple different things here. Uh, first thing we can take a look at is um, basically how to attack a file with uh, a Windows password prompt. Let's look at that. Here we go. I'm going to open up a file now that has been uh, protected. This is just a simple demonstration of a password. If we open up this uh, document, this is a, a protected Word document now. It's protected against change. Um, when I try to unprotect it, it's going to give me a password prompt in just a regular box. And we're going to use that for our demonstration. Okay? There's lots of other things you could hack against. Um, I often demonstrate this in hacking against the, uh, the PGP Windows prompt where you can do a passphrase. Uh, that's another good example. This is a pretty simplistic one. Let me show you how this guy works. As soon as you uh, go to unprotect this guy, it pops you with, it pops you with an authentication screen. Okay? Now, this authentication screen is a screen in itself. You notice it floats around. It does all the good stuff. If you're a programmer out there, you know that you know, this box has controls. It's got a name. It's got a box. It's got... Uh, different actions that can por perform ag uh, against it. You could, of course, snoop this box, which I'll show you in a second. So you could find out what all the controls are doing, uh, what anything that's being entered in here. And I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, even when it enters star, 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 of course, you can get it to reveal all that because it has to broadcast it as part of the control. That's rather an obvious thing, but I'll show it to you in a minute anyway. Uh, generally, let me show you an attack on this guy. Um, this box is up. We're going to now find my, actually, let's just do it this way. We're going to run an old program. Works really, really good, though. Um, it's called Claymore. You can get it on all the good hacking sites, hackers.com, uh, all over the place. Uh, works really well, uh, really, really well, and it's really, really easy. Uh, so that's why I like to demo with it. Let me show you what it does. Basically, what Claymore is is it's a very simplistic program that allows you to uh, use dictionary attack or random character generated brute force attacks. Um, what it does is it gets the focus of a window, and then it just throws passwords at it until it's successful. Um, there's lots of different ones of these utilities. It's actually not that hard to even write one of these. 
because all you're doing is going through a file, reading the output, and then sending it out to the screen. It's, it's not hard at all. It's really simplistic. So uh, let me show you how this guy works. If I choose a file, I'm going to choose a dictionary file for this. This has got a whole bunch of uh, different uh, passwords in it. It could be a dictionary file like user dict off the internet. It could be my, uh, there's lots of different Linux password crackers that use large dictionaries that you can get off the internet. This dictionary file is not that big uh, because it's only for the sake of example, but you can get really huge ones. Um, I then entered the strokes that I wanted to do after it uh, enters its password. And so it goes through the entries one at a time, enters the password, and then it does these keys to finish up. I could also have a whole set of keys that it has to do. It has to hit control F1, uh, switch around, change window focus, do a whole bunch of things before it runs. But in this case, it's pretty simplistic. So what it's going to do is it's going to go through these words one at a time. So I hit start. It's going to start counting down. Then I point it at what I want it to break. I point it right here. It's going to count down, and then it's just going to start going crazy on that window and throwing passwords until it gets in, and it got in pretty quick. And you notice if I let it keep running, you're going to see all the passwords that it's thrown at it. And it throws them fast, 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 fast. And this is, it's running pretty slow because it's running inside Word. If I did it at a text editor, you see it even runs faster than this. So it just goes through until it finds the password, and then it's, it'll actually just keep going anyway. Uh, but you can use that against anything that has a Windows password prompt, anything doesn't matter what it is. Unless it's got, unless they're smart enough to put something in like a maximum number of attempts, something like that. Other than that, you can use this against that. And you're, you'd be surprised how many things don't put maximum level of attempts. The other good uh, countermeasure to this when you're programming is putting in the time limitations. But you can account for that in this. You could restart the, you could restart, open the document again or something like that. You could have a new setup sequence in the beginning of the document to close it and then open it again. And then you may get around the timeout. You may not have to wait 30 seconds or whatever. So this is a simplistic thing. The next thing I'm going to show you also to go with this that's also simplistic is what I was just talking about. And that is the, uh, the sniffer for Windows. Um, again, this is a, just a regular hacker tool that you can get off hackers.com, you can get it all over the place. It's actually just a uh, small, uh, almost like a VB debugging type of tool. Because if you'll notice, you'll notice if I put this up here, this is the window that reads my, uh, the text out, right? If I take this cursor and I put it across anything that's a, a control, you'll notice that it's going to bring up what that control does, check for update, about, that's the name of the control, okay? All these things are broadcasted. If I bring it up here on top of the password there, it tells me that the password that I entered, entered under all those stars is DEF COM. This works really well for anything that stores a password if you, you know, forget your password for anything uh, and it comes up star, 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 it will always decrypt that. There are a couple companies that have done a good job of uh, subverting this, and they basically don't let the password even enter in the program. They're not entered into the window. Uh, old versions of PGP, actually, they still came up. Uh, new versions of PB PGP actually block this now, so uh, it doesn't broadcast the password out. But most programs that you get, anything that you get this star, star, star with, you can get the password out by just snooping the window, and it'll give you the password that you entered. Pretty simplistic, pretty easy. Pretty effective. Gets the, gets the password out really quick. So that's that guy. So we're not going to change that. Now, all right. So the bad part about file encryption or any sort of file password prompt is that it runs in multi threatened tasking environment. Um, and the other bad part is that the password security is the only, is only, or I should say the security is only as strong as the password. Two-factor authentication helps you out a little bit here because you can't hack at two-factor authentication. It's, uh, you know, you need a little bit, you need an encryption key, you need a response. It might change multiple times. There's lots of different things you can do for this. 
Yeah. Mark? What if you lose your smart card? That's a good question. Uh, the answer is that there's a lot of different uh, things out there that work in an infrastructure so more than one person have has access to your information. There's a couple different uh, systems that are built to run inside like an administrative interface, whether you are your own backdoor or administrator or you know somebody else is. You could lock it to two smart cards, lock it to a, a something different, a smart card and a token, or lock it to a, have a fixed password as a backdoor, but have it like 50 characters, something crazy like that, so you don't have to type it in every time. Ran something randomly generated, lots of different things. Okay, so now on to some different tools that we have to work with on this whole thing. If we want to get the information off of a machine, some of the uh, tools that we have available to us is uh, sector editors. Sector editor that I'm going to show you today is uh, Nort Utilities 2001 Disk Edit. Uh, works really simply. It's got a lot of nice features in there. It's got searching. It's got spanning. You can look all over the disk. So even if you were in a situation like Norton for your eyes only, which messed up the boot record a little bit, I could still search for any information I wanted on the disk and take it all off. So a confidential document, uh, a PowerPoint, anything like that, I could go around it and just zoom right through it. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, sector editors that are available on the market. It's actually not that hard of a thing to even write a sector editor if you wanted to. Um, the, if you go do a query on like download.com, you'll notice that there's a bunch of them like WinHex and things like that that uh, are pretty darn good sector editors. So let's switch over here. And we'll take a look at uh, what they do. That's, now, that's a good question. This is an effective, sector editors are not effective on things that do encryption on the data. That's correct. You have to attack, things that do encryption on the data, you would need to attack them through the method like I was just showing, where it throws multiple passwords or uh, through attacking them through, actually, I, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say this isn't effective on, on things that encrypt the data. Let me give you an example. EFS, which is coming up in probably three or four slides. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Things that are implemented well, if they encrypt the data and they implement it well and they trash all of the old temp files and they do all that good stuff, this, this attack method does not work. But if they have implemented their encryption of the data in any dumb sort of way that they don't encrypt the temp file, they don't uh, encrypt the page file, there's lots of different things. You know that could have information left in them. Then you can get all that to all that information with the sector editor. So let's take a look at what the sector editor looks like. Let's see, not that guy. This guy right here. Okay, here we go. Okay, our sector editor. If we start it up. As I said, I'm going to use the Norton one just because it's pretty and it shows kind of well, but there's a lot of other ones. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm on the wrong drive. Yeah. I need to reboot it. I need to reboot it. No, I need to reboot it. Here we go. Let me boot up onto this boot disk and enable the. Uh, the disk so I can see all the information on it. By the way, if, you're, if you are looking at trying to get information off machines, uh, a really good utility to make is uh, there's a CD burner program out there called Roxio, which a lot of you may use. Uh, you'll notice that they give you an option to build a bootable CD, which is really useful if you want to be able to go to a machine and get anything you want off of it, because you can basically mount uh, 650 megs of tools to play with whatever and do whatever you want with on that machine, which is what I'm doing in this particular case. Okay, disk edit.
So I'm going to bring this up in read-only mode, take a look at my C drive. You'll notice that in most cases, Disk Edit understands even your file system, so it makes it vastly simplistic. It sees all my files. It sees all my directories. I don't even have to look at this in hex or all those other things. I could pick up any one of these files and uh, take a look at it. Um, I'm going to change the view a little bit so we can take a look. Uh, you can look at it as different file systems. You can look at the partition table. You can look at the boot record. You could modify this guy as, uh, however you want. Uh, we could also look at what the information is looking like on the actual disk and search through it. Search through it one piece at a time to try to find the data. So if we were looking for data on somebody's machine or something that we lost, all we have to do is zip through here and we can have any data that we want off this machine. And this is reading it at bypassing all security, file level security, everything. All we're doing is taking this directly off the, the sectors of the drive. Pretty simplistic, but it's pretty powerful. So that's what they look like. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look at them before. Uh, let me show you what the partition table and everything looks like. You can tell what operating system is on the machine just by booting to it, even if it were protected. Uh, you could tell, uh, even with file encryption, uh, what type of operating system attack you wanted to do. If you wanted to plug in a key logger underneath uh, so you could pick up the keys that were being entered for authentication to pick up, open up a file encryption, you could do that. You could tell which partition is being booted from, so you could intercept that and put it in a false boot sector. Uh, you could do pretty much anything you want. Uh, disk editors are your favorite tool for taking a look at uh, everything on that machine. Um, so they're, they're pretty comprehensive and they really let you have a lot of access to the machine. All right. Again, that, uh, that one was Norton Utilities, but you can get a lot of free ones off the internet if you wanted to just take a look at your machine. It's pretty easy. You can't hurt anything as long as you leave it in read-only mode. And it's definitely interesting reading to, to figure out how the file system works and how it's storing information and how it retrieves it. And it's definitely important if you want to try to keep your information secure from other people getting into it. OK, so how does this uh, link up with the encrypting file system? Well, the encrypting file system, EFS by Microsoft, uh, is a popular topic out there. Uh, in government, in companies, all over the place, and a lot of people are implementing it, and a lot of people, it's like PKI was a couple years ago. Uh, you know, everybody thinks, w thought PKI was the end of the universe and that uh, it was a solution to every security problem. EFS is what that is now. Uh, everybody you talk to in a company, they're all, EFS is unbelievable. You can uh, protect against it, but uh, really, there's a lot of attacks against EFS, most of which you've probably read about on the internet. Um, NT Bug Track uh, has got a lot of good stuff about it. Uh, Microsoft themselves, uh, in that URL that I started off with there, they talk a lot about all the different attack methods that have been used against EFS and are all successful. Uh, and that's why they basically said that thing about if you have physical access to the machine, there's no way that they can prevent you from having access to it because they don't have a way to, to secure EFS right now. Um, one of the uh, one of the two main ways that you that EFS uh, stinks is if you encrypt information quite often, unless you're creating uh, information in an encrypted directory and leaving it in an encrypted directory, it's got a big problem with temp files. I don't know if any of you have seen it, played with it, or tried it, but if you were to actually look uh, for a temp file, you encrypt a Word document, you encrypt an Excel file, you encrypt a PowerPoint presentation, something like that, you would find that the temp files for that file, when you move it into an encrypted directory, still exist. And you can read all the information fully encrypted. So you actually get two copies of your data, one encrypted, one non-encrypted. The unencrypted one, fully accessible, you can read it anytime you want. And the encrypted one with your certificate encryption. Now, the other really interesting way, and 
I almost thought about demoing it today, but it's, it takes a lot of switching, and you can see how interesting the switching already works out to be, switching between multiple computers, is the recovery agent attack. And most of you must have already read about this. When you set up uh, EFS originally, EFS by default sets your local administrator to be, if the machine is not part of an Active Directory domain, sets your local administrator to be the recovery agent. What the recovery agent is, is the person that is able to save you if you screw yourself by forgetting your password. It's a password backup utility. And most programs that encrypt data have this sort of thought built in. So basically, if you mess yourself up, you have somebody you can go cry to, or uh, uh, either an administrator you can cry to, or your own backdoor that you put into the encryption when you set it up so you can get your data back if you forget your password or you forget your uh, authentication scheme. Um, but basically, the bad thing about local, local administrator becoming the recovery agent is I don't know how many of you have ever played with uh, a utility called Loafcrack, but uh, it's pretty easy to get local administrator. Um, Any way from booting up into NTFS DOS, and taking the SAM file and hacking the SAM file uh, so you can log in as administrator to uh, you know just deleting the SAM file entirely which I'm sure some of you know if you delete the SAM file entirely Windows has to recreate it in, a, in, a, in order to be able to start up again so you end up with an administrator with a blank password that is the recovery agent and the local administrator so you have access to all the files so if you have physical access to the machine again you can get anything you want. Other bad thing about uh, filing, about EFS is that it has, uh, you know, the regular baggage that comes with PKI. Now, there's a lot of people that are really hot on PKI. I think P PKI has its place, particularly in things like email um, and in exchanges uh, and things of that sort. But I don't really think that it's good for encrypt general encryption of, of, st of sitting data. Uh, and one of, those problem, one of those reasons is certificate theft. Uh, one of the big problems with uh, storing information in companies, in your house, in anywhere, is that the people that are likely to get atta uh, to attack it is not you know, some foreign government or something like that. It's more likely somebody that knows something about the computer, somebody that knows something about you, has done research about you, or your mom, or something like that, you know? Somebody that, <laughs> that knows something about you and can make guesses about your password or knows your machine, and they may, can get physical access to your machine. Well, if they can get physical access to your machine, they can steal your certif certificate. Now, certificates are, somebody's gonna raise their hand in two seconds and say, yes, certificates are protected, but they're not protected very well. There's a lot of different ways out there to get the pins off certificates, lots of different ways to attack certificates. As soon as you own the certificate, you own all the data. You can do both two things. First thing, you can decrypt anything you want. And second thing, you can pose as anybody you want. And if you can pose as anybody you want with a certificate, I mean, as far as a certificate goes, if you're using certificate as authentication, then uh, there's not much purpose to it. So EFS uh, has a lot of flaws in it, and it's not really generally uh, uh, very secure. So. How do, we, how do we attack a machine before it started? Oh, I'm sorry, it's cut off a little bit at the top there. How can I attack a machine before it starts? Well, I think I've showed you a couple different ways. Uh, you can steal the hard drive. You can boot from a boot disk. You can see whatever information you want. You can play with NTFS DOS, which uh, a lot of you have definitely played with. NTFS DOS lets you mount anything uh, that's NTFS uh, from a Windows NT or a 2000 machine in DOS, look at it, read, write it, edit it, do whatever you need to do. NT Locksmith, another uh, product from the same company, lets you basically rewrite the SAM hashes so you can inject your own account. Um, there's also some more interesting things as we get down to its bottom. Lovecrack, everybody knows about, lets you do the NTLM hashes. Uh, basically try to decipher passwords out of your, your uh, SAM database. Then, of course, there's uh, the new hot topic for hackers, which is uh, Active Directory injection. 
Uh, basically, I can inject any data I want to in an active uh, directory with no way of tracing it uh, or taking it out or anything like that. So there's a lot of companies now that are basing their security, uh, their mail systems, their everything on Active Directory. They're, they're trying to move everything into to running off that system. And there's really no way that they can prevent you from injecting your own email accounts. Um, you know, Brian Glancy at whitehouse.gov, for example, or uh, whatever you want into the system if you have physical access. Uh, but all these attacks occur by using an alternative operating system against the machine. You boot up into DOS, you boot up into another operating system, Linux, or, or something like that, and then you attack the operating system when it's not in a started up state. And there's, it's very, very hard to prevent. The only real way to prevent it is to maybe either encrypt all the information on the machine beginning to end, or have, uh, I know there's some military installations that have hardware encryption, basically encrypting cards that encrypt all the data on the drive. And basically, if you don't have that card, you can't get the data off the drive. There's a couple different ins installations. Floppy locks, exactly. Um, here are the tools from sister, sister kernels that you should take a look at if you're interested in the, doing this sort of thing. Uh, NTFS DOS uh, does what I just talked about. It lets you mount uh, NTFS read write from a floppy disk. So you can do anything you want to to a uh, NT system, whether it is take the SAM, whether it's take the files off there, whether it's try to defeat EFS by deleting the SAM and restarting the recovery agent, whether it's in, uh, injection into Active Directory. So basically, with this type of attack, uh, an NTFS DOS, you know, if you, needed, if you had physical access to a server for any company, you could inject anything you wanted from you know, your own email account to your own bank account, if it were a bank, to whatever you wanted. If you have physical access to that machine, you can inject into the system. NT Locksmith, uh, just a utility that lets you reset inject accounts into SAM. Uh, pretty simplistic. All it does is reset the hashes to a known value. That way you can, you know the password for administrator all of a sudden. Works like a charm for every system. Uh, you basically just boot up from it and you run it and then on the system, on the target system, and then all of a sudden, boom, you've got root, you've got system administrator access. What, uh, that's a good question, yes. The, qu the question was that NT Locksmith requires an ERD and uh, NTFS DOS requires two machines. NTFS DOS requires that you had made the disk in advance. I've made these, I made the floppies, my NTFS DOS floppies, I don't know, six months ago. I carry them around with me whenever I need them. I just pop them in my machine. So I had to have a machine sometime in order to create the NTFS DOS floppies. I don't need anything else. I just stick them in there and then boom, I got it. Now regarding, uh, regarding the question about NT Locksmith, it does require an ERD in some circumstances, but there's some, they have some advanced options that you can do to work around it, even if you don't have the ERD. Lovecrack, we've probably all played with it. Easy, fun, fast. It basically doesn't fail. Uh, it's got a lot of different ways for you to hack all of the passwords inside an NT system, an NT domain. Uh, you can take down, either just take the SAM file, crack it offline, which is nice and safe because you don't have to worry about sitting at a desk inside a company or something like that, and, or wherever you may be, and taking all the files off there. Or um, the other thing you could, of course, do is you could uh, sit it down at that computer, put it in, and uh, run it inside Windows and run it real time. Uh, everybody's probably seen it works really simplistically, dumps all your passwords, and then it cracks them all one at a time. Works very quickly. Pardon? That's right. <laughs> exactly. John the Ripper, so you don't have to pay. There's a lot of utilities like this. Uh, I usually use Loft. You're right. It's, it's, you do have to pay for Loft. You could use it for 30 days for free. <laughs> uh, so anyway. 
Um, and by the way, if you start uh, playing, when I'm playing with the SAM file, uh, the SAM file moved, just so everybody knows. Uh, SAM file used to be in system root on NT4. Now it's in system32 config. Uh, SAM file is still in there. Great. So uh, I have a section in here on how hard drives work. I think we've already covered a lot of this. At the low level, um, hard drives are just ones and zeros. All the uh, information that we place on it, all the different file systems, operating systems, and everything are just manifestations of that. Uh, every time we look at a sector editor, you usually look at those things in hex. The hex is just a higher level interpretation of that binary that's being written on that disk. So um, there's, it's very hard to protect the information that you're writing down to that disk unless you encrypt it at the low level or you were to uh, you know, do the floppy lock like we were talking about or protect the, the authentication against that. Um, on the low level of these machines, they include partitions. The partitions are just basically logical drives. Everybody knows this. Uh, the, ma the master boot record, which has a record of all the information, the partitions that are on this disk, how they start, where they go, how big they are, all that good stuff. When you pick it up, you can take a look at it in disk edit uh, and a lot of other utilities too. Um, and basically, you could see where your partitions are. You could resize it. Things like partition magic, this is where they play. All they do is change the numbers in there. All they do is resize the beginning and end sectors, beginning and end cylinders to, to change the size of your drive. It's pretty, pretty simplistic stuff. Uh, the next part of the whole, the whole story is your boot sector, of course, which is where you actually get into your operating system. The master boot record, as I mentioned before, contains a marker for active, uh, it's a single bit actually, a marker for, uh, or byte, I'm sorry, for uh, active partition. The active partition is the partition that you want to boot from. All it does is repeat the same process that it did for the master boot record. Actually, I have it up here on the screen. Uh, the same process that it went through for the master boot record reads that information into memory and executes it. So it reads the beginning uh, 446 bytes off that, uh, that drive and then executes that program. So if that program were you, it would execute you. If it were a boot locker, it would execute the boot locker. If you had a boot locker on it and you wanted to execute you, all you do is replace it with a regular Windows 95 boot sector and you're fine. So basically, all the boot, uh, boot sector does is point to the operating system that you're going to load and say, you know, dump to uh, WinNT or dump to NT Loader, dump to command.com. Uh, That's all it really does. OK, so examples of secure authentication. Um, one of the ways to mitigate all this stuff is to figure out a good way to authenticate yourself. And there's some cheap ways. And there's some expensive ways. Uh, expensive ways include things like biometrics, even though they're getting cheaper. Um, there's a lot of really good ones that you guys may or may not have played with. Uh, there's a lot of cheap fingerprint readers. There's actually a, uh, some good new ones that are PCM AI cards that pop out right out of the side of your machine. Um, some really good stuff out there. Other forms of two-factor authentication that are less expensive uh, include USB tokens. People that make these are like Aladdin and Rainbow. They make very cheap authentication tokens that have an encryption algorithm built into them. So basically, you put this USB token on your key ring, you carry it around with you. If somebody turns on your computer when you're gone and they don't have that key in there, it's not going to read any of the information off there. So, and they're actually quite strongly encrypted. They give you, uh, there's, they're really hard to attack. So if you have information on your machine that you don't want people to be able to get to, this is a good way to protect it. There are also smart cards out there. A lot of people make smart cards. They're a little bit more expensive because you've got to invest in a reader. You know, a little bit of a pain in the butt. But uh, they're not bad. Uh, challenge response tokens. There's a, a lot of different people that also make something. There's a standard for it, X9.9. .9. Challenge response tokens. But what they basically are are tokens that have a little encryption algorithm built into them. And basically, uh, the computer knows your, the, your, the encryption algorithm and the card does. And it generates a challenge and response that goes back and forth between you and the computer. 
in order for you to authenticate yourself. If you miss it, you don't get into the computer. So uh, uh, this is another good method. And uh, it's really a good one. Uh, all these different ones are really good if you want to be able to maintain control of your information even when you're gone. Somebody comes and tries to get the information. You've got the physical token, and they've got to say, give me that physical token before I get it.